Thanks. So I'll begin with a bit of introduction about myself. So uh, my name is Sam Zerman. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Freebird. We'll learn a little bit more about Freebird uh, in a minute. But part of what motivates this talk is understanding ways in which deep learning uh, can be extended into risk management contests. So I've been working in risk management for about six years now. Um, and as anyone who's lost money on a model that they can't interpret will understand, uh, I think this talk really tries to capture the work we need to do yet uh, to enable uh, decision making in financial contexts and risk management contexts um, using deep learning methods. So um, the first part of the talk will have a little bit of a salesy feel uh, as I explain what Freebird is and what Freebird does uh, and the main data science problems we're trying to solve. The second part of the talk uh, is going to describe the way in which a particular problem for a particular model that our team is uh, leverage deep learning uh, differentially compared to other methods um, uh, to solve. The third part of the talk, which is the most kind of advanced and the most interesting research we're doing, is extending deep learning methods using Bayesian deep learning uh, to interpret and understand those results a little bit better. Um, so to start, um, I'll offer a, a short explainer video that um, explains uh, the problems Freebirds are trying. Freebird is trying to solve. We've all been there. You're traveling somewhere important when your flight is canceled or significantly delayed. So what are your options? Wait in line to rebook? Spend time on hold with the call center? Shell out big bucks for a last-minute replacement ticket? You feel powerless and overwhelmed. Availability is disappearing by the second, and you've got somewhere to be. Freebird is here to help. Freebird is a simple tool that gives you rebooking control. When your flight is canceled or significantly delayed, Freebird empowers you to instantly book a new ticket on any airline at no additional cost. Purchase Freebird coverage through your travel agent or at getfreebird.com after you buy your flight ticket. If your flight is canceled or significantly delayed, Freebird will notify you immediately. From there, it's just three taps to rebook for free via your mobile device. Tap to open your alert. Tap to select a new flight. Then tap to confirm your selection. It's that fast and easy. With Freebird coverage, you're in control. Travel empowered with Freebird. So, uh, as I hope the video explained, uh, you pay for access to Freebird before your trip. Uh, it varies, and we'll get into why and how that varies in a bit, but it's about $20 for each leg of your trip, so outbound and return. Now, as a startup, we've raised uh, uh, millions of dollars from top-tier investors, including General Catalyst and Accomplice, uh, people who have built Airbnb, Kayak, and other major travel brands. Uh, and Empowering all of this offering uh, is our risk model. Uh, our risk model um, is what we call a, a collection of models across our problem domain that produce estimates about the likelihood of a flight being disrupted, the likelihood of missing your connection, the likelihood of a cancellation occurring, or a storm shutting down an entire airport, as well as the expected cost to buy a new ticket. Uh, and as anyone knows, dynamic airline prices can be quite difficult to predict. And we're having to predict that in very low availability moments whenever everyone's scrambling to buy a new ticket. Now these, we think about this risk in terms of expected loss. So while we charge about $20 one way, a part of that risk um, is what we're going to have to pay out in buying new tickets. And those, those, the, each ticket and each trip has a variable uh, likelihood of being disrupted, as well as an, a different cost to replace that ticket. So if you're flying from uh, Boston to San Fran up to Chicago, two very uh, windy cities in uh, America, the likelihood of your flight being disrupted is higher, as well as the cost to replace that ticket, because it's a really busy commuter route. Whereas if you're flying from two very sunny locations, the likelihood of a flight being disrupted, as well as the expected cost to replace the ticket, may be lower. Now, the, the, the set of variables with, with which these um, two major key pieces of our, our risk model can vary 
uh, are immense. And we've worked for over three years to understand and quantify the risks of offering our product. So uh, that, I hope you now kind of understand some of the core ideas and problems we're trying to solve at Hoover. Um, today, we're going to try to answer a slightly different problem, um, which is of your flight departing today, what is the likelihood uh, of what is the likelihood and magnitude of that delay? Um, and so as a result, um, we needed to assemble a massive database. We have over one billion files um, spanning our entire problem domain. So we have uh, data that uh, we have a da one data feed that is a stream of all priced itineraries, all priced trips across the entire world. Um, this data, we get about 5,000 different requests per minute for that feed. We also get about 200 megabytes uh, of data a day on flight statuses. Our uh, internal soft, our, our, um, our servers are ingesting all flight statuses across the entire world and at any moment can reconstruct the state of the airspace um, to understand the ways in which a flight getting stuck in one city um, or a plane getting stuck in one city might cause a delay in one uh, a delay in a flight uh, much further away. Now, the the important thing to understand about this problem, what makes it incredibly difficult, is that at the time we're having to make our prediction about the likelihood uh, and severity of a delay, um, we have differential access to data. So if we're making an estimate, you know, 30 days out. Uh, we might only really have climatological information, seasonal information about large-scale trends. But as we get closer and closer to the time of departure, we get access to much more, more, much more information. The day of departure, we're able to ask things like, where was the plane before? Uh, or where was the plane coming from? And where was it coming from before that? As well as understanding how major weather um, uh, systems are impacting the U.S. airspace. Because the network, because of the network effects in the U.S. airspace, a hub like a major city like Chicago going down can impact the entire rest of the U.S. airspace in ways that are really hard to understand. And we've spent a lot of time using network analysis to try to better quantify the impacts of those larger nodes on smaller nodes. So um, we're a really small startup. You know, we don't use deep learning just to use deep learning. Um, we first tried a number of a lot simpler methods um, to estimate uh, to estimate the likelihood of a delay uh, 24 hours before departure. And what we found is that you know a, a lot of traditional, very in, uh, industrial-friendly algorithms like random forests and linear regression simply weren't performing as well as an RNN. And I would say that in in, in this model, we're, we're actually this estimate is actually one component of our flight-by-flight -flight prediction model, but even the RNN is, is not quite at the level where we can expose to end travelers. This model actually is, as a result of kind of the performance at this point, is only exposed to our internal agents who are helping people rebook during these times of disruption. Now, the why I think that um, deep learning did differentially outperform, uh, I think the first thing is that, you know, we, as, as the earlier speaker alluded to, we actually have a massive amount of data. And so, a lot of um, methods were not scaling in a way that was super friendly um, to the, the feature space that we are trying to, to understand. The second uh, point, which I think you would, I, I alluded to a bit earlier, is that this, the feature space is large and there's a lot of nonlinear interactions between things like weather, origin weather, and inbound flight delays, uh, as well as the, the way a, different, a certain carrier chooses to economically run uh, its flights. So there were a, a couple, you know, challenges in this approach. I think machine learning and, and deep learning in particular uh, are really robustly developed in, in, in one domain, vision, and I think it's, they're also a lot better in other domains um, like, like sound and language. Uh, our problem domain is such that we have a lot of categorical features as well as continuous features. So we, were, we, we needed to have, uh, have a normalization step beforehand um, to embed our categorical information into a, a, uh, into a representation that was much more friendly uh, to deep learning techniques. Um, 
this um, map here is a map of um, uh, it's a, a representation um, using PCA of the nearness of different uh, or uh, delay patterns by airport. Um, and for those of you who have ha flown through America, there's kind of some intuitive results embedded in there. Uh, for example, the entire New York corridor kind of tends to go uh, go down and function well in one step, even though it's three distinct airports. So this is kind of the basic architecture that we used, and our the, the chart on your um, your left uh, is our performance, uh, the observed delay versus the predicted delay uh, with an with an okay correlation. This is actually kind of an earlier model. Uh, and I'll talk about our, our newer model in a bit. Now, uh, I hope by this point to have explained why uh, data science and statistics are important to Freebird. Um, and I hope to kind of have motivated some of the core problems we have, which are trying to understand and quantify the risks of taking a trip. Um, and the last part, I, I, I kind of showed you a model uh, where deep learning differentially outperformed other methods. Um, but as combining those two ideas together, the question is, how can we, if we have a prediction um, that's really quite accurate, how can we start to understand the uncertainty around that estimate in a more holistic manner? So um, most of the models that we build are from a kind of a different branch of statistics than uh, a lot of AI and ML methods, and that's Bayesian statistics. Um, Bayesian statistics is a type of, is, a, is a way of um, building a model of the world um, using probability distributions that, that, that work well together um, and then adding data um, to then produce better distributions that you then sample from for your predictions. Now there's a couple of major advantages to having a model of the world. Um, one, which is quite important to risk management, is that you can understand what aspects of the problem you understand well and what aspects of the problem you don't understand well. Uh, deep learning methods and a lot of other machine learning methods don't allow you to, to, to really robustly understand um, what aspects of the problem or what features are contributing um, uh, to your inaccuracy or accuracy. Now, the major issue with Bayesian methods is that they tend to be very computationally expensive. When you're trying to combine that data uh, and those probability distributions, that you end up having to integrate off over kind of an output distribution called a posterior distribution. And when you're performing that integration, it tends to be computationally intractable. And so that's one of the major reasons why you don't hear about Bayesian statistics as much, is because while it's you know uh, quite robust and well understood, um, you're not able to kind of scale it to the to the big data problems that that many modern uh, uh, machine learning problems have. So um, that's kind of provides a, a little background about Bayesian statistics. Now, uh, deep learning, while is differentially outperforming most other methods in most other problem domains, is actually only producing pointwise estimates. So it's not out of the box giving you any sort of understanding of what the possible outcomes could be for that estimate. Or even in a more basic sense, how confident the model is about a given estimate. And so the, the Bayesian deep learning is an attempt to interpret and leverage some of the skills that Bayesian statistics have in a deep learning context. Now I'll provide a bit more context as to why and what um, Bayesian, the way we tie these two things together. So as I mentioned earlier, Bayesian statistics um, has a very um, expensive integration step. And what we, there's a couple distributions that are more friendly to distributed that can, distributing that calculation across many different servers. And so in the, in the early 2000s, I think perhaps late 1990s, variational inference um, is a manner of taking distributions that are very computationally expensive to produce and approximating them using distributions that uh, are a lot more computationally friendly and easy to distribute, enabling you to approximate Bayesian behavior um, uh, while not having to complete that really expensive, potentially intractable integration. 
And so Bayesian deep learning, um, to tie this all together, um, is a way of interpreting or understanding uh, a, a deep learning technique called dropout. Dropout um, is, <laughs> sorry, this is getting quite involved uh, several steps down. Dropout is a technique that's made deep learning very, very high performing. And in dropout, what you're doing is you have a complete network, and you're arbitrarily dropping out certain nodes. And by doing so, you're actually able to more uh, produce better uh, generalizations to new problem domains. And it's one of the main drivers of deep learning success in the past five to 10 years. Now, dropout um, can be understood, and what kind of the, 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 the field of study that we're really interested in and focused on at Freebird is understanding and interpreting dropout as a type of variational inference, as a way of approximating these different smaller distributions. Now this work was championed in the, in the 1990s by McKay and has recently been popularized by Yaron Gao. Um, and I think that the, the New Yorker cartoon to the side captures the importance of, of really the, of the work we're trying to do in understanding and interpreting what these models are doing. So, uh, yeah, but. so um, there's a couple major advantages um, to Bayesian deep learning. The first, as I mentioned, is that it's scalable. You're able to leverage the cheapness of modern compute uh, in a manner that uh, in a manner that uh, allows the problem to be cut up into smaller pieces and solved rather quickly. Um, the second thing is that it does allow, as you see kind of on the image to your left, a type of uncertainty estimate. And so while there's a lot more you'd want to know, there's a lot richer understanding of a model that full Bayesian statistics give you, uh, having uncertainty bounds is a step in that direction, uh, and it's the most promising method so far of doing so. And I think the third point, which I, is one that's kind of somewhat counterintuitive, is that one of the advantages of Bayesian statistics is that you can understand which parts of your data set are more important to your model and then weight them intelligently. And so I think that another advantage of these Bayesian deep learning techniques is that you can understand uh, and also differentially uh, encourage, give more um, data to your model um, that is relevant to helping it understand the problem. So, um, the model, to, to kind of bring it back to Freebird's case, the model here, um, we're trying to predict uh, the likelihood and severity of a delay uh, 24 hours to, before departure up and until the time of departure. And the use case for us um, in a future world that we're still not quite there yet is uh, enabling um, travelers to rebook preemptively. So before your flight's canceled, before you miss your connection, sending you a text and saying, hey, this flight's, you know, it's not going to go very well. Why don't you rebook for free? Taking all the stress and strain out of your trip, not even having to be scared that your flight's canceled. And so far, our, our initial res uh, re results suggest that across all major airports, as well as some smaller airports, um, we're able to, um, uh, to understand the likely, the, the, um, both the likelihood and the severity of the delay in a well-calibrated manner. Now this plot, which I think looks rather simple, um, but is quite important to the work that we're doing, is an uncertainty quantification plot. And so, starting with the plot to your right, um, you're looking. You're, you want to ask when a model says, "I'm 50% certain that about this estimate," is it actually well calibrated? 50% of the time is it right? 50% of the time is it wrong? And so, a perfect model would be totally. Um, would, uh, would be that orange dotted line. The results of our model and analysis are actually that blue line, which suggests we're quite well calibrated. Now, the, 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 you might ask, well, in aggregate, is that the case? But is that potentially weighted by several larger airports? Um, what well, we actually find that is across many different airports, we actually see a similar well calibrated um, uh, estimate. Um, so our model, when it's making a prediction, is able to say with some confidence how likely it is to be correct. 
an interesting aside here, which I think um, is was was counterintuitive to our folks, and we double checked it a couple times. Is that the impact of weather um, steps ahead, um, where steps ahead is um, a feature of an RNN, where uh, you're plugging a prediction for the the likelihood of a delay two hours out into your model that's producing an estimate three hours out. We're actually seeing a fixed cost uh, in our prediction estimates, which is which is quite surprising. Um, I think it's also quite intuitive that that weather does have a major impact on these predicting these flight delays. So um, I think I'd like to close with three takeaways. Um, the first is that in our problem, in our particular problem of estimating the likelihood and severity of a flight being disrupted, d deep learning is differentially outperforming other methods. The model I walked through today is our, our airport estimate, which is a component of that prediction. Two uh, is that risk management applications, uh, domains where you have to understand not only, you don't only, only want to make a good prediction, but you also want to understand the other possible outcomes if your prediction is wrong, require a lot richer understanding, uh, a lot more built up model than what current deep learning methods give you. And the third is that Freebird has performed work um, to extend these uh, deep learning, uh, to extend deep learning uh, to, um, uh, to enable uncertainty as quantification estimates to be extracted from our models. Um, I'd like to end with uh, a bit about our team. We, as I mentioned, this is our only deep learning model we use. The rest of it is Bayesian statistics. And this is a simple uh, uh, GIF of, this is a simple GIF of an MCMC sampler uh, learning Freebird's logo in real time. Um, so if you're interested in Bayesian statistics or the intersection of Bayesian statistics and machine learning, uh, please talk to me after the conference. Um, while I am the CTO and co-founder, um, much of this work was done by this team, uh, particularly TJ Vandal, uh, Max Livingston, uh, and, and Cayman Piho in this, in this particular talk. Uh, I'd also like to flag that, uh, you know, Pappy's has been an exceptional conference for us. Um, we actually submitted this work um, to PMLR through um, this conference, and it was accepted. So uh, we're both thrilled and excited to contribute to pushing the boundaries. Uh, and thankful to this conference for giving us the ability to make it happen. Thank you, Sam. Any questions for Sam? Hi. Uh, very good talk. Uh, I'm. My question is about um, uh, you are. Did you guys? Like compare two questions. Do you like compared normal Bayesian statistics that you can run offline with your uh, <coughs> neural networks using Bayesian to give you more like a white box approach mm -hmm. uh, in a matter of like prediction? Mm -hmm. uh, like a Bayesian is twenty times lower, but is one percent better or something like that. Uh, we did, but we kind of uh, tripped at the first step. Uh, Bayesian methods weren't scaling even close to the, uh, to our problem domain, so we didn't. We we tried it with much simpler, smaller problems, and in our traditional risk management problems, we're constantly fighting with scaling our samplers. Uh, we it, it simply wouldn't have been. We wouldn't have been able to get comparable performance. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to evaluate the models um, given the difficulty of setting up the inference. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the second question. And the second question is, uh, <coughs> you mentioned that you use, uh, I think, logistic regression and handle forest, and then you compare them to L LSTM on the matter of the, I, I guess, the forward pass, the, the running time of the forward pass was on one of your main uh, focus, yep. uh, I guess. But uh, as you said, there are a lot of categorical features and <coughs> and continuous features, but if you are using LSTMs, you are first inter interested in the time correlation mm -hmm. of the features, right? Yep. And in, in, in the talk, I couldn't see if you guys are, are doing like time series that uh, normally in interval samples, or is like a point process, uh, like event 
10 days from today and five days and two days. And if it is, uh, the answer is yes, it's point process. How do you guys tokenize the timestamps of the data? Like if the data pass five days before and two days, how this token is different from 10 days to two days? I don't know if you understand. Uh, got it. So in, in, in our framework, we're only doing the previous step. Um, so we're not uh, having to worry about kind of indexing those previous timestamps. So I guess that answers both of your okay. questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hi. Uh, I have a, one question and one curiosity. You said that you have the data if the company, if the, 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 that plane you will go to another destination, you just stop and get more. Uh, so how do you get this information? Because it, the, is the flight status, I think that's public, -y, but the other information that could be uh, from the companies, how do you have access to this kind of information? Uh, the short answer is I spent three years of my life <laughs> scouring the globe uh, for access to d these data and data sets, um, in particular in the flight status domain. Um, it, it's a, we actually were the first people to kind of come with a really sophisticated statistical uh, interest in the data and actually were the we actually had to pay them to extract new data that they didn't think anyone wanted. So um, it's not public, it's you need to pay the companies to get access to this data. Yes. Okay, and the second question, you said that you, you were using uh, network analysis because of the hubs like Chicago. So how do you incorporate this information in your model or how do you use this information? So we particularly have been focusing on that in episodic risk. So when we talk about, when we think about risk at Freebird, we think about three different types of risk. We think about risk like, well, if you're driving a car, there's a lot of fender benders that happen. And we have models that estimate fender bender risk. Um, there's also catastrophe models. There's terrorist attacks. There's really massive events um, that have a large amount of impact on our risk. Those are catastrophic risk. In the particular problem domain where we spent the most time in understanding network analysis is episodic risk. So that's something like a major hurricane or thunderstorm coming through and knocking out part of the network. And the, the questions we're trying to understand are, when this node goes down, uh, what are the other nodes that are impacted? And what is the resiliency of the network? What's the ability of the network to distribute the load across other key nodes? And so we were, we're other major nodes. Um, so we're focused on that network analysis in that episodic risk where it's only taking down part of the network. I encourage you to check out resilience um, studies, networks of resilience studies, which I think have some of the most advanced approaches to understanding um, uh, the robustness of networks to um, in perturbations. Well, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, you said that you currently are publishing results that you uh, obtained on a new type of uh, technique for LS Bayesian LSTMs. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, um, I've been uh, struggling in the past to actually do research in uh, or lead my teams to do actual research on, on uh, those kinds of advanced topics. Uh, it seems that the short term uh, needs of the product always kind of ends up trumping uh, your ability to actually write a paper and publish and test this new um, state-of-the-art uh, uh, research. And how do you guys balance it? Yeah, totally. So I'll, uh, I would say there's kind of two drivers there. Um, the first is um, that um, as a startup with a lot of IP in our core risk models, so our models that are we use to price our product, um, we can't just show investors that. We can't show the public that. But we need a way to demonstrate expertise. We need a way to show that we are you know, capable and understand statistics. This, uh, by publishing, we're able to provide an external indication about our ability without having to show all of our internal models. The second answer, uh, which I think is an important thing to understand in a startup context, is that your people are, the, are what matter, matter the most. And data scientists who are exposed to lots of methods, uh, particularly more difficult methods, 
uh, are both happier and are going to be able to perform uh, better at their day-to-day -day tasks on a, from their work in harder problems. And so I think the first is understanding uh, having a holistic approach um, to uh, building a team, uh, as well as kind of understanding that uh, there's a need to communicate expertise. That was going to be the last question. Um, So uh, just stepping back a bit, so you talked about that you use linear regression and random forest. So is your data relational or it's not? Is our data relational? Yeah. Uh, so we have a domain model. Um, the feature creation process is such that we're, um, we, we're, we're, um, we don't have a domain model for all of our features. The vast majority we do. Um, but it is not relational. We're mostly, as I, I, I we actually, Kind of have a, done a lot of work in the MapReduce and Hadoop based uh, space, and so it's it's not as it's not in a format that is relational uh, whenever we're training. I see. Thanks. Okay, as Sam was saying, there's uh, there's a paper. It's going to be published soon. Uh, we're still finalizing a few things, so it's published via the proceedings of uh, Pepe's. Uh, the previous conference we had in Boston. Uh, Sam was one of our speakers in Boston. Uh, we're hoping to also bring some of our local speakers here in Brazil to the Boston conference. Uh, looking forward to reading more in the paper. Uh, thank you very much, Sam, for the kind words uh, about Papis. Thank you for um, the paper that you submitted. And uh, yeah, please, uh, another round of applause for Sam.